grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The basis for today's sermon is the gospel lesson that we just heard. The great catch of fish and Jesus calling his first disciples. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, note what Jesus is doing out the, at the outset. He is preaching. He's preaching to large crowds who are gathered around him. And by his preaching, he is drawing men and women, boys and girls, young and old, rich and poor. He's catching sinners, bringing them to the faith. It's like he throws out the gospel net, and whoever gets caught in it, he just drags them in. Due to the eager crowds who were pressing in upon him, Jesus steps into Simon Peter's boat. That they, though they have spent time with each other, Jesus hasn't asked Peter to be his disciple. Not yet. Peter, James, and John, they are still full-time fishermen. Now, though, inside of Peter's boat, Jesus continues doing what he was doing on the shore. He's preaching. He is preaching about sin. He is preaching about judgment. He is preaching about God's law, God's mercy, and he's preaching about faith in the Messiah. When he concludes his sermon, Jesus asks Simon to take the boat out into the deep waters for a catch. You've got to be kidding me, right? I mean, Peter explained that he and his companions have done that all night long. They have dropped their nets in numerous places, regular places, doing so numerous times, and they have got nothing to show for it. Tough night. What Peter doesn't know is that God had a purpose behind him not catching any fish. It is the lesson that God wanted him to learn, and it's what he wants all of you to learn as well. Imagine what might have run through Peter's mind at this moment. I mean, not only are he and his deck hands pooped, but the heat of the day, that is not the time to go fishing. And what, pray tell, does Jesus know about fishing anyway? I mean, he is a carpenter by trade. And now he's this traveling rabbi. What Jesus requests... It just makes no sense. Experience told Peter it was foolish. Reason told Peter that it was pointless. Though Peter has every earthly right to reject the command, he doesn't. He listens. He agrees to take the boat out one more time. Forgetting the things that he knows and the things that he's seen, and been taught, Jesus follows, I'm sorry, Peter follows Jesus' word. Now this is very similar to Mary, is it not? Mary, who when the angel promised that she would have a baby, even though she had never known a man, said, let it be to me according to your word. Or even like Abraham, who even when he was old, trusted the Lord's word that his seed, not Eliezer, his servant, but his seed would save the world. Both Mary and Abraham, they could have easily said, you know, I don't really understand the mechanics of this. It makes no sense. But that's okay. I believe. Folks, that's our problem. Our human reason constantly wars with what the Lord says. Regardless, Peter... He navigates the boat to where Jesus tells him and the nets are cast out. And we wait. What is that? The hand line, that, it just twitched. There it is again. You gotta be kidding me. Somebody help me. All hands on deck. 
This catch is enormous. It's the biggest one ever. This was more fish than the nets could hold. They fill one boat. They call over the other boat that's manned by James and John. Both boats now team with fish, weighed down, riding low in the water. It simply cannot get any better than this. Smiles on everyone's faces, excitement is in the air, flopping fish everywhere. However, as everyone celebrates, terror comes over Peter. It dawns on him whose presence that he actually is in. This is God in the flesh in my boat. Peter knows what happens to sinners who stand before the face of God. He knows God's wrath burns hot against sinners and nothing unholy can stand before him. Peter, as it were, is stripped naked and exposed with every idle word, every lustful thought, every single transgression brought under the lens of this heavenly microscope. Peter sees only one thing in his future. And it's hell. That's what he says. God's punishment, an endless, tormenting darkness, and thus falling on the deck with flopping fish all about him, Peter says, depart from me. I am a sinful man. Beloved, the gospel does not deny your sinfulness. It declares it. Peter was no murderer. He was no adulterer. But he was still very sinful. Very much so. Sinful from birth and sinful in his thoughts, words, and deeds, making him unclean just like all people everywhere. The proper reaction to that sin is not to deny it. Try to defend it. Try to excuse it, but to own it, to sorrow over it, and to confess it. The good news is this. Instead of departing, instead of doing what Peter told the Lord to do, Jesus offers Peter pure grace and comfort. God had not visited Simon Peter's boat to destroy him. He's come to rescue him. To rescue him from his sins, his disordered desires, and the death that he scrambles to anxiously avoid. Yeah, you're a sinner, Peter. Worse still than you even realize, but do not be afraid. Christ came to save sinners. Folks, you're sinful too. And I am too far more sinful and corrupt than we even, we even can realize. But the wrath that you and I have earned and deserved has been poured out upon Jesus. He takes God's wrath for us. He drinks to the dregs the cup of God's anger so that His gifts now to us might overflow. One of the gifts that he offers is his announcement of peace to all who repent. You know, it's the word spoken over you when you come to confession. It is the word given to you in the bread and the wine at the Eucharist. It's Jesus' word at the burial of the one that you love. And to you in your death, do not be afraid. Trust his word. Because it's always true. And by it, you have the certainty of the forgiveness of all of your sins. Well, for Peter, Jesus does one more thing. He calls Peter, of all people, into the ministry of the Word to now be a fisher of men. That phrase can be misleading. From now on, you will be catching men. It's better translated, as I read it, 
you will save men alive. Or you shall be reviving men it's as if Jesus says, Peter, you used to catch living fish. You drop them in the boat where they die and eventually be eaten. Your job is getting ready to change. You'll be catching men who are dead in their trespasses and sins, and you'll make them alive, reviving them. That's why I love why the Nicene Creed says, the Holy Spirit is the giver of dead men and women. This is this death and resurrection theme that we see all, all throughout the scriptures. Recall what was Jesus doing before launching out into the middle of the sea? He was casting out the gospel net. He was pulling in whoever believed. But his plan was not to do that forever. He only planned to catch men on earth visibly in person for a few years. Why? Because his earthly ministry was to end in the crucifixion, the resurrection, and the ascension to the right hand of God the Father Almighty. His plan was ultimately to draw people into his kingdom through the preaching of sinful men. Men just like Peter. Sinful men who preach the gospel. And this is why your pastors wear that white tab on their throat. I've told you this before. We don't wear a white tab patch on our heart to show that we're great men of compassion. We don't wear it on our knees to show us that we're, or show you that we're great men of prayer. We wear it on our throat. And this is why the rest of the shirt is what? Black. Because we're sinners just like Peter, but when the gospel is preached, that's why you'll never see me in a clerical with a collar that's one of those Hawaiian shirts. I'm a sinner just like Peter is. Sure, Jesus could have easily chosen to send angels to preach the gospel. For starters, angels are sinless. They're perfect servants of the Lord. Moreover, angels would gladly do it and they work for free. For crying out loud, use them. But that's not what Christ has ordained. He's chosen only sinful men to preach the word in season and out of season, meaning when people like it and when they don't. Pastors are to catechize, which means teach. They teach the faith, and they are to baptize, use water and the word to make disciples, whether they're minutes old in the hospital or on their deathbed. They are to forgive sins and celebrate the Lord's Supper, all of which comes with Jesus' promise to be with the pastor as he does these things even until the end of the age, just as he was in the boat with Peter. I am with you, Peter. I'm not going anywhere. For the last 2,000 years, this is how the church has been built. God sending catchers catch you. The catcher, whoever that may be, he casts the gospel net out into the chaos and the darkness of the sea, and then he closes the net, drawing those in it away from judgment, away from condemnation, into the safety of his church. There's a few here and a few there, a thousand there, 20 over there. They all add up to that great multitude which no one can number of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb. See also Revelation. By the way, this is why you should support the preaching ministry here in our midst by coming to church and to Bible class, by listening, by concentrating, by praying for your pastors and our missionaries, by your offerings and by your obedience to the Word. It's all because this is what God has ordained. Now folks, it's easy to look out at the world and see the culture change and just degenerate before our eyes. Every day you think, okay, maybe things will settle down today. Nope. It just continues to circle the drain. We're tempted to think that we need to tweak something in the church here, either the message or the ministry of it. I mean, we've got to reach more fish. That's what 
people say. They say, word and sacrament, that's just not enough. We need not think like that. We dare not think like that. Instead, we trust in the power of the gospel. We trust in the power of the Holy Spirit to catch mankind when and where it pleases God. And we indeed are so grateful that he sent catchers to catch the likes of us. Praise be to God. In the holy name of Jesus, amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We stand together for prayer.